Okay, awesome. All right. So thank you everyone for coming again. I'm super excited to be talking to you guys this month all about our wildlife education initiatives here at the South Florida Wildlife Center. Um, I know that in the past we used to have different um, education programs that we used to do back when we were partnered with HSUS, but a lot has changed and there are so many new things that we're doing. And above all, there's an ambassador program that we've created that has never in the history of the South Florida Wildlife Center been a thing. So I'm super excited to share, you know, what that program is all about and the individuals in that program. Um, and just kind of, again, talk about the different things that we're doing to help our community understand our wildlife a little bit better. Um, so it's not working. There we go. Um, all right. So we'll talk about what wildlife education is, which is pretty much what's in the name, which is education about wildlife. Um, and essentially what it is, is just kind of sharing that knowledge about, you know, what's going on in your backyard, why it's happening, why it matters. Um, and the most important thing is just to share that with not only our future generations, but with our fellow counterparts to make sure that everyone just kind of has a better understanding of what's going on. Because when you understand something a little bit better, you're less likely to be scared of it and things like that. So we just want to share what we know um, and just kind of get everyone's curiosity going so that they can then love, you know, what they're doing um, and share that awareness with their community. Um, we love going to schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, we even got to colleges. Um, and we go ahead and talk about what wildlife rehabilitation is. We talk a little bit about human and wildlife conflict and, you know, the different things that people, you know, bring to us every day um, and how those situations could have been prevented, how they happened, um, what are some solutions to that. Um, we also welcome home care, um, I'm sorry, um, yeah, uh, home uh, students who do schooling from home um, and they have come to us with different field trips as part of their curriculum and they have also spent some time here to learn about the different patients that we have um, and it's always been super exciting to see you know again different kind of ways that people are educating about biology and the natural environment and again the ways that they can get involved um, on top of doing you know school field trips and dedicating our time to students we also go ahead and support our different partnerships whenever they have events going on we'd love to go out and do tabling events where we go ahead and just talk about who we are, what we do, um, spreading different resources that people may have not been aware of that you know, were available to them. Um, and just kind of, again, spread the word that we're here to help um, in case anyone sees anything. Um, and then lastly, we have, you know, a really amazing group of staff members here who have taken tons of time and years of experience and are sharing that with future rehabbers, students who are in college who want to pursue this field, um, and veterinary students who are looking at, you know, majoring their or concentrating, you know, their focus on, you know, wildlife. So it's super exciting that we get to help out in different avenues and, you know, make sure that our community is well supported with, you know, if they do need any information. Um, and it's very exciting that not only are we able to do it that way, but that we also have other creative ways that we're, we've been able to get our message out there and again, spread the word about what we're doing and who we are. Um, you may have seen posts throughout our social media that we are doing public releases for certain patients that come out. Um, I think there's one going on um, next week or so. We're still finalizing those details, but there's a few pelicans that are ready. Um, and we want to go ahead and get those guys, you know, back into the wild. And we invite you guys to be a part of that so you can see their freedom journey. Um, we also have been hosting these wild lecture series. This is year number two now that we've done this, um, where we've showcased different, um, you know, organizations that are working with wildlife or in some sort of biological, you know, um, avenue. And we're sharing what they do and just, again, trying to inspire people to go ahead and be a part of that. We have a home care program, which some of our volunteers have been a part of where they go ahead and get trained to take care of babies until they're a little more, you know, independent and are able to join our nursery to finish their rehabilitation. Um, so that's an opportunity that's going to be opening back up, you know, early next year. Um, on top of that, if you, you know, haven't seen um, our website or our social media, again, we do have four public presentations that we do at the local parks every single month. 
our ambassadors are always, you know, there. So there's always an opportunity to meet some of these guys. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after I introduce them. Um, but we are again trying to just spread, you know, awareness throughout, um, you know, our uh, our community, and we're able to just kind of get people involved and just inspire them in different ways. Um, I keep mentioning our social media. So we're currently on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I do post things on Nextdoor, on LinkedIn, and, and then we started a TikTok, which will hopefully be, you know, we'll we'll keep going with it. We'll try and figure it out. It's definitely a, uh, a finesse that we have to learn, but we definitely have the cute animals for it. So stay tuned for that for sure. Um, we also, um, like I was mentioning with us teaching our students, we do have college students who do internships here in either a specific department or in various departments. Um, and we also have volunteers who, again, want to help our local wildlife by volunteering at the center. And you can do so in so many different ways because you are either able to, you know, work with the actual animals or if you wanna do other things, you're more than welcome to. So we are, you know, teaching about wildlife um, in that aspect of well, because we do have actually a lot of volunteers and interns who have become wildlife professionals um, after spending some time with us, which is always super exciting to hear about. Um, and if you haven't received it yet, um, we do have monthly e-newsletters that we send out um, where we are updating everyone on what we're doing. Um, on top of that, we have our quarterly newsletters that are also, you know, um, printed and mailed out. So those also have some fun features about either, you know, some of our amazing staff members that are being featured, some of our new ambassadors that are joining us or different things that we are, you know, partaking into again, keep spreading this awareness and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to you know, help our community understand, help protect their local wildlife. Um, I think my computer froze, no it didn't. Um, so education matters because of course it's what's going to keep this field going, it's what's going to keep um, you know, allowing people to care for these animals and you know, promote change that will eventually help um, you know, make better lives for everyone involved. And it's also a critical part of our mission. Um, so what we do essentially, and what we've always done for the past, you know, 53 years is, you know, rescue a wild animal that's in distress, that needs treatment, that needs to be stabilized. And we'll bring it to our wildlife hospital where, you know, we have amazing veterinary staff and their goal is to figure out what's wrong and figure out a game plan to get it through rehabilitation so that the goal for everyone is to get them back out into the wild where they belong. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's one of those things where they have to be perfect to be sent back out into the wild. They have to be able to, you know, um, fend for themselves. They have to be able to find food. They have to be able to find a girlfriend. They have to be able to make babies. Um, so if they're not able to do that because something is physically not perfect or mentally they're not perfect, then it makes it very hard for them to go out there and not only survive, but thrive as, you know, wild animals in an urban jungle. Um, South Florida is rough for everyone involved. So it's one of those things where, you know, our really supervisor has very strict criteria. Um, and, you know, a lot of the animals that come through here, again, the goal is to get them back out, but they have to check every single one of those boxes. Um, so the ones that unfortunately don't check all of the boxes are what we are calling non-releasable. So those are the guys that, you know, will still have a good quality of life. They're just not able to be released back into the wild. So depending on their temperament, depending on their age, depending on kind of the situation or the injury or whatever's, you know, making them non-releasable, there are different placement options. Um, you have your standard, you know, zoological areas like Zoo Miami, Palm Beach Zoo. You may see a lot of native animals in their Florida sections that were deemed non-releasable for, you know, whatever reason. And those are the guys that you can typically go up to and see them on exhibit. Um, but then you have places like Flamingo Gardens, Sawgrass Nature Center that are local. These are the guys that have small sanctuaries. So these are, again, animals that were deemed non-releasable, um, but it's a smaller group and it's usually just focused on native animals. Um, zoos will have obviously animals that are international because of their conservation efforts, whereas these open sanctuaries are just kind of giving these guys, you know, an opportunity for people to get up close 
with their local wildlife that they otherwise may not be able to, you know, get that close contact with. Um, some sanctuaries are close to the public, but they do provide, you know, long-term care for some of these animals that are not able to be released. And then you have places like us, where we have a resident collection on site. We have outfitted enclosures that were here. We have bought new enclosures for some of these guys. Um, and we have designed, you know, protocols and everything in place to give these guys a new home. Um, and though we're not open to the public, we do bring these guys off site wherever we can. Um, and some places do have that where they do have a closed collection, but they are able to bring them out. Um, hopefully in the future, maybe that changes. Maybe we can have like a little section where people are able to see these guys. Um, but for the most part, this is what we're doing it now where we have them off site with their own team caring for them and they are all ready to go. Um, and they're able to showcase, you know, out in the community, little things that they do. Um, so with that responsibility, we understand that we have now accepted that we are going to be caring for them for the rest of their lives. And it's not something that we take lightly. I chose every single one of these individuals, um, you know, for their stories. And they have all done amazing jobs so far at telling those stories and have changed so many lives. And it's super exciting. Um, but we understand that, you know, their enclosures have to be you know, made for them and give them more than enough room. That enrichment is on the table all the time. They have their own team dedicated to just them because it's not patients anymore. And these are animals that are perfectly healthy, but again, we're not able to be deemed releasable. So at our hospital, you know, we have our patients that are in one part of the center, and then we have these guys who are in another. And typically, you know, there is no cross contamination. They have their own food source. They have their own bowls. They have their own their own people, um, and they are treated differently, obviously, because these guys are enriched in different ways throughout the day. And we want them to like people because, you know, when they go out, they have to be comfortable, um, you know, in those public settings. Um, and more importantly, the bigger thing is making sure that we tell their stories, you know, and why they were deemed not releasable and what we could have done maybe to change that and how they're working to keep their wild counterparts wild out there where they belong, you know, so um, it's super exciting. Um, and they are some of the coolest animals, in my opinion, that I've ever worked with. And I've worked at several different zoos for a very long time. Um, and I have to say that these guys definitely take a cake, which is exciting. Um, the reason why we push for this program, which again has never happened in the history of the South Florida Wildlife Center, is because we believe that they are the key to educating people and just kind of creating that connection to understand, you know, what we're talking about. It's one thing if I'm in front of you saying something, you're going to either listen to me differently if I have an animal with me, or you're actually going to pay attention to what I'm saying, um, just because you're like, oh my God, what is that? You know, let me learn all about it. Um, so we definitely, you know, kind of been their voice so that they can go ahead and foster that appreciation and foster people to understand, okay, well, that sucks for him that that happens. Let's see what I can do to prevent that from happening. Or, oh, I didn't know that, you know, opossums were, you know, useful and I thought it was this or I thought it was that. So it's super exciting that, you know, we are able to, again, have people interact with these guys in such a way that it changes their mind about some myths that maybe they had um, and they're wanting to go ahead and help. Um, above all, I think a lot of the kids that we've dealt with, they definitely come out with like, oh my God, that's so cool. And, you know, they go on to kind of care a little bit more about, you know, their interaction with animals in the wild. Um, more than anything, it allows us to talk about, again, their story, why they're not releasable, what happened. Um, for the most part, they're all human, you know, inflicted injuries, unfortunately. So it's one of those things where we can talk about how it happened how it could have been prevented because the goal is to not have animals come to our hospital because if they do, it means they're sick, they're injured, they're orphaned. Um, and the goal is never, you know, obviously to have that happen. So these guys are trying to just send that message of different things that people can do just to provide less conflict for wildlife to, you know, again, come in as being sick or injured or orphaned. Um, so 
With that being said, we do have 11 animals that we call ambassadors here. Um, three of them were imprinted, which means that they don't know the animal that they are. So we were not able to release them because they would not know the first thing about, you know, being that kind of species. Um, four of them were surrendered um, as pets. And I can talk a little bit more about that with those individuals. And then four of them, unfortunately, were injured past the point where they could be released. Um, and they are now here, you know, learning a little bit about how to kind of live with humans instead of, you know, fearing them. So, and they're all doing a really, really good job. Um, as you can see, we have a good variety. We have some uh, reptiles, we have some birds, we have some mammals. Um, and again, they all have their little quirks and uh, fun things. And they definitely, again, have done their job at helping us teach people and the community to care a little bit more um, and help, you know, protect these amazing species that call, you know, South Florida home. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the individuals. Um, we definitely, um, um, again, they're all in chronological order. So Kingsley, our Florida king snake, was the first ambassador ever. Um, and he is a Florida king snake. Um, and he actually um, was one of the surrendered pets that we got a month after I started here. So him and I have a have the same journey here at the South Florida Wildlife Center. Um, as you can see, he came in and he pretty much fit around my pinky. Um, what happened was that he was bought from a pet store. Um, and I guess they didn't ask the right questions or I'm not sure what happened, but they were offering him salad and they were like, hey, he's not eating this, he must be sick, what do I do? Um, so we talked about how these guys eat rodents um, and other snakes, which is why they're called king snakes, um, and that there were different options. You know, we always advise frozen thawed where these guys are already, you know, um, deceased, they're just thawed in the head, um, and they just could not handle the idea of feeding you know, him a mouse. So they're like, oh, we'll just release him. He's he's from here, right? Um, unfortunately, because he was captive bred, um, you know, he didn't have that initial journey to kind of figure out his lay of the land wherever he's from. They do have very tight home ranges once they're hatched. So we did um, just ask her to bring him on over, checked him out. He was healthy. Um, and since he was nice and small, and I've dealt with king snakes in the past, they make excellent education animals, excellent pets when they're cared for properly. Um, so he's kind of been with us since. Um, I always joke that when I uh, leave here in, I don't know, 10, 20 years, I'm taking him with me um, because he's amazing um, and he's just a good snake. And as you can see in the past couple of years, he's grown quite a bit. So he's about three, you know, three, four feet. Um, and my favorite interaction with him was when um, a woman who was terrified of snakes, you know, got to touch him, realized how soft he was, and then started listening about, you know, why these guys matter. Um, the majority of our animals are here pickup, you know, cleaning crew. They'll make sure that there's, you know, no abundance of rodents. They'll make sure there's nothing brewing parasites or diseases or bacteria in your backyard through, you know, uh, fallen fruit or old food or carcasses and things like that. So everyone on our ambassador team, you know, matters for the environment. Um, and a lot of people just don't realize that. So, you know, with snakes, they keep rodent populations down, which then keeps disease down. Um, and they are just good to have. So it's always nice to kind of be able to tell people, one, you know, if you see a snake, you don't have to kill it. That's not the option, you know, that you have. You can let it go. We can talk about safe deterrent methods if you're not comfortable with it being so close. Um, but he's definitely a Spartan people. Um, and everyone who touches him is always so surprised by how soft he is, um, which is super cool. But um, again, he's done a really great job and uh, we're super proud that he is with us. Um, cabbage is our next one. He came in as a um, orphaned, uh, you know, baby, which means that he was found by himself. He was too small to be alone. He was covered in fleas. Um, he had no tail. Um, so when they brought him in, they were like, oh my God, what is, what's wrong with him? 
So, you know, we figured out that he was anemic from all of the fleas that he had on him. Um, we realized that the injury to his tail was old. So either something tried to eat him and yanked off his tail or it got stuck on something and he yanked it off. But somehow, some way it was a clean, you know, clean cut, if you will, um, and it healed. There was no infection on it, but he had so many other issues. So he actually went into foster care, my house, and uh, he was with me for a couple months getting better, you know, being handled. Um, but because he had no tail first and foremost, and he was raised by me for that fostering process, um, we were not able to release him back into the wild because when they're young, they use that tail for so many different things. Um, and he just wasn't going to be able to get around or get away from things, unfortunately. So he's been with us ever since. He actually um, will be turning two um, in uh, January which, you know, good and bad, they don't live very long. They live about, you know, two to three years old. So he is an old man, even after only being with us for a little bit, but he definitely is so charismatic and has changed so many people's lives with, again, understanding that opossums are our friends. Um, they're not bad. They don't have rabies. They actually do a lot of really cool things. Like again, you know, they lower the spread of Lyme disease because they eat so many ticks. They eat up dead things that are in your yard that you didn't even know you had. Um, they pick up old fruit that has fallen. They, you know, make sure that again, like everything is nice and clean. Um, and they're just super important, you know, to have out there. So we've definitely taught people to appreciate these guys and be grateful that they're, you know, they're in their backyards. Um, and for the people who have met, you know, cabbage and Brussels and, you know, cauliflower, um, they're always so surprised by their size and how they smell and you know, how soft they are. So um, it's always been exciting, but he has come a really long way. Um, and we are so excited with how he's doing. Um, his tail is still a little knob. We always check on it, but he's one of the ones that, you know, obviously has a special place in my heart. Um, but he has definitely inspired so many people to care, which is super exciting. Um, and he lives in his mansion. He has a catio. He prefers the second floor. Um, he, we know his favorites are, you know, dairy and certain fruits. Um, so he definitely is a uh, living the life, if you will. Um, his cousin, I guess, um, Brussels Sprout, um, has a similar story. He came in as an orphaned baby as well, um, but he went through the whole process because he was physically perfect. Um, he had his tail, he had everything he needed. He went through the nursery, um, he made it all the way to rehab. And you know, some of the caretakers were like, hey man, this opossum is awake during the day. He keeps climbing on me. He keeps sniffing me. We don't think he's okay. We think he imprinted at some point um, because he wants to be near people and he wants, you know, that affection, which is so abnormal because these guys are supposed to be scared of you. That's the whole goal is for them to, you know, be, you know, out and, you know, uh, on their own and not want to approach people. So, you know, we did some exams, we did some test drives and yeah, no, he just, liked people he liked affection so we went ahead and we you know unfortunately were not able to release him for that um and he again has also spent his time here started off at you know only a couple hundred grams and is now the biggest opossum that we have he's a little over nine pounds um, so he's come a long way um, and it's average size, you know, they can be definitely a little bigger, but he's healthy, he's of good weight. Um, and he actually is the one that does the best out of the three when it comes to public presentations, just because again, he loves that attention. Um, as long as there's food, he's okay. He doesn't mind it. He doesn't mind the noise. He doesn't mind, you know, if people approach him, you know, so he's one of the ones that we may take out if it's going to, we know it's going to be loud or we know it's going to be, you know, kids involved or things like that. Um, we actually took him to, um, you know, again, a ton of different places. I and mean, we have an event next week that he'll definitely be at, um, but I'll talk about that in a second. But again, he's coming up on two years old and around, you know, March, April, we guesstimate their birthdays. Um, and he, again, is living life. There is nothing, nothing wrong with him besides the fact that he just likes people. He's a social butterfly. Um, so he's going to continue spreading the word, teaching people all about the cool things that opossums do, again, why they're important um, and why people should, you know, care and protect them and, you know, do what they can to make sure that, you know, they, they thrive out there. 
Um, and next is Lyme. She is actually an Eastern box turtle who was also um, surrendered um, as a pet, but it's a, it's a, it's a rough story. So she was, um, she hatched in a neighborhood in Georgia, um, just in someone's backyard and they kept her. So they took her as a baby from the wild um, when she was super, super tiny. And they kept her for about three years or so. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, they didn't take the best care of her. So, you know, she has some shell deformities, she has some limb deformities, so she's not able to defend herself, she's not able to get away. Um, and unfortunately, that's why she was deemed unreasonable. She came in with another turtle that we named Lemon, so it was Lemon and Lime. Um, but Lemon had a, you know, severe spinal deformity that after a year, unfortunately, you know, we just, we couldn't let her, you know, risk her prolapsing and having her intestines, you know, sit a certain way. So unfortunately she did not make it, but Lyme is here to tell, you know, both of their stories because they were both stolen as babies from the wild and cared for inappropriately. And I'm not saying that turtles are not good pets because they are, you just have to know what you're doing. So make sure you ask the right questions, make sure you have the right enclosure. Um, but technically, you know, this species isn't found down here. Um, they kind of border Georgia as like the most Southern part. So um, we did fly her on a plane um, and she has been here again ever since. Um, she just finished her, you know, year of her street with us if you will, um, a few months ago. And again, she's been doing great. Everyone loves her because of course she's so cute um, and she will be with us for a good decade or so. Um, and we're gonna, you know, go ahead and make sure that she's healthy. She has a sunning little bin outside that she hangs out in when it's nice and sunny. She has her little soaking bins. She has an enclosure all to herself outside where she can dig, hide, do whatever she pleases. Um, so she's definitely living the life. Um, and if you have any kind of bug, she loves you. So, you know, again, she's here talking about the importance of turtles and how they are good for the environment and how they provide, you know, different services to keep the ecosystem nice and healthy. Um, and of course, she teaches all about what cool box turtle things, you know, that are going on in the world. Um, <laughs> one of the favorites for a lot of people um, is this next diva. Um, so this is Olive, our Easter spray towel. She actually was a transfer from Flamingo Gardens, um, but unfortunately, so her story is really sad. Um, she is physically very healthy, fully flighted, excellent feather condition, at all, she has all her toes, her beak is perfect, her eyesight is perfect. Um, what happened was, um, she's cute, obviously, and as a baby, a lot cuter. So someone unfortunately took her as a baby and she imprinted on humans. So she does not know how to owl. Um, to this day, she has a hard time understanding certain things. If I put a worm in front of her, she looks at it and she's like, what is that? What, what do you want me to do with that? So she was deemed non-releasable because she will just not be able to survive out there. She doesn't know or do any owl things, unfortunately, um, because again, she was taken as a baby and it is illegal. So, you know, we always advise, please, if you find a baby owl, there are things that we can do to help make sure that it gets back out, you know, where it needs to go. Um, so she has been with us uh, for a while. Um, she was, came to us when she was about seven months old or something like that. So she was this, you know, a young sub-adult. So we've been working with her for a long time. Um, she stands on the glove perfectly. She lets me touch her wherever I need to touch her. Um, but she is a diva because there's more often than not times when she's like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't need to eat right now. No, that's okay. You can stand there. I'm not going to do anything. So, you know, she's always been a, a fun, charismatic one. She makes the best noises. She gives you the best looks. So that's one of the things where, again, on our TikTok, I'm hoping to capture some of those diva moments so that people can fall in love with her spicy personality. Um, but she, you know, has the role of teaching people the importance about owls and migratory birds and how these guys are important and how it's also important to leave them out in the wild because they have, you know, things that they need to do out there. Um, and, you know, again, she's been with us for a while and she's easily, you know, one of the favorites because she's small and she's cute. And as you can see, she came in all 
you know, young and <laughs> feathered. And now she's this gorgeous, you know, adult with, again, perfect conditioning with looks that say so many things. Um, and we're excited that we're finally at the point where we can take her out um, and she can attend schools and she can attend, you know, events uh, because she's finally comfortable, you know, with different settings, different noise levels. Um, all of our ambassadors are, you know, trained to the point where they are comfortable in these settings because I'm not going to take an animal out that's going to freak out and it's going to be a bad experience for them. Everyone here has been conditioned to accept and be comfortable in these settings. So again, it took us a while, but she's finally, you know, at the point where she needs to be, where I trust that she'll be able to go out to an event, stay on the glove and, you know, allow people to approach her, um, not touch, but, you know, because her beak is still sharp. And again, her talons are good to go. There's nothing physically wrong with her, uh, but she may get spicy and be like, okay, <laughs> you know, too close for comfort or something. So, you know, she's one of those that, again, we should see out and about more often. Um, and that's super exciting, you know, as this, you know, year comes to an end. Again, we're hoping to get her out as, as much as we can. Um, our third and final opossum um, is Miss Cauliflower. She actually has a really, really sad story um, where she's one of the ones that was injured. Um, and because of that injury was not able to be released back out into the wild. Um, she actually was found on the side of the road um, in Orlando. So someone hit her um, with a car and then just left her there. Um, someone else who was driving down this way noticed, um, pulled over, and then also saw that she had eight babies in her pouch. So it was not just her, it was her and her eight joeys. Um, so she drove down here. Um, we admitted her, as you can see in that photo. Um, she had jaw fractures and she needed some teeth to be removed, but outside of that, she was okay. So she went through a long process where she was able to continue to raise her babies. She was able to have that fracture, you know, uh, looked at. We did surgery and it's currently healed in place. She did have a good amount of teeth on that one side removed. So when she eats, her tongue kind of sticks out a little bit when she tries, but it's, you know, cute if anything. Um, and she, again, just fell in love with the staff, um, loves the affection. And, you know, she's a little more sensitive to noise. Um, and if you surprise her, it's one of those things where she takes it a little more dramatically than the other two. But um, more than anything, we just noticed that like she can't smell really well. She is startled by noises. Um, and on top of that, she is affectionate. So she was not able to be released. We do think there is some brain damage involved. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we don't know how old she is, but she'll stay here until her time does come. But as of right now, I can tell you she is still a spicy little lady. Um, she loves her food. Um, again, we're working slowly to introduce her to different kinds of settings. But right now she does the smaller, quieter stuff um, where she goes out, you know, on her harness, lets people touch her, lets people approach her. And she, you know, is more of the one where she's trying to uh, send the message of, hey, when you're driving, be careful, especially at night, because nocturnal animals, for the most part, they all have terrible vision. They can't really see you coming. They might hear you coming. They might feel you coming. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of animals that unfortunately do get hit on the side of the road, it's because they just, you know, unfortunately weren't able to get out fast enough, or they just, again, weren't aware that the situation was happening. So, you know, luckily she was able to be brought to us. Luckily we were able to do everything that we could. And thankfully she is still with us. And again, she is, you know, a staff favorite and we love her here. And she is, you know, um, the lady of the trio. I call them the trio of trouble um, because they all have, again, their little quirks, but she is, um, she's doing really well and we're very excited that she was brought onto the program. Um, some of these guys we have not announced. So um, we'll start with that. So this is Bree. She is a great horned owl that was actually transferred from Crow Clinic in um, Sanibel Island, which unfortunately was just hit by that hurricane. Um, and it's unfortunately we're sending, you know, any help that we have with her, um, with them, any help that we can, uh, you know, provide them. We've taken in patients from that side um, and we're hoping and spreading positive vibes that they're able to get everything they need to to reestablish that hospital. Um, but she was brought to us before that hurricane hit. She was, um, and it breaks my heart, uh, she was um, living in someone's like backyard type area. 
Um, it's not like Miami where we have small backyards. It was like a big, I guess they had acres um, and they just noticed that, you know, she would come around um, and she had, you know, little babies. So um, sometime um, after her last set of babies fledged, they noticed that she was on the ground injured. They thought she had some sort of wing injury and something happened. So they were able to scoop her up and bring her to Crow where they, you know, realized that she had um, an eye injury. Um, her wing was okay, just a little banged up, but she was missing a very important digit, you know, on her foot. Um, Raptors have a set like this where that last foot acts as, you know, what they use to kill their prey. And the one nail on the one foot, unfortunately, was dead. So they did have to go ahead and amputate that digit. Um, by law, that makes her non-releasable, unfortunately, because, again, that's one of the bigger tools that they used, you know, to be able to, you know, um, go out and hunt her prey properly. So she was deemed non-releasable. And right now in the rehab world, a lot of these guys are unfortunately euthanized because as adults, they get very stressed out in human care. But she um, she has the temperament where she's okay, but she definitely still has her sass about her. She doesn't trust people just yet. Um, she lets me get close to her. She lets me feed her. She lets me, you know, get weights on her. And slowly over time, you know, we'll build that relationship where she can, you know, get on a glove because she wants to and be able to walk around and introduce her, you know, to people. So we do have a long way to go with her, but um, she's doing well. She's never missed a meal. Um, and she, you know, is currently, you know, just kind of always giving me that side eye, if you will, but it's more of a, okay, all right, I see you, all right, you can go now, and over time, you know, we'll go ahead and build on that relationship, but we're excited to bring her into this collection because um, she actually eats everything else in our collection, so she's a top predator, um, and she's super important, again, to have out in the, you know, environment, and to be grateful that these guys are in our ecosystem, keeping a balance to, you know, all the other animals that are here, so uh, I'm more excited to hopefully introduce Brie to the world. I'm hoping by this time next year, um, we're going to give her some time, we're going to give her some love, um, and we'll see maybe one day she's just like, all right, fine, I'm ready. I like you, you have food, here we go. So, you know, we're hopeful for that. Um, on top of, you know, the great form, we actually took in um, two striped skunks. Um, uh, we have chives, and then we also have um, a second one, a female. These guys were um, transferred to us from the Florida Skunk Rescue. So unfortunately, these guys were, you know, they were bred as pets because skunks are legal to have as pets, but they weren't cared for properly. Um, they were, you know, not socialized. So unfortunately, these guys were either going to be euthanized because they couldn't be pets or they were, you know, going to be brought to a center like ours for us to give them a shot and get them to socialize and get them out to do presentations so that way we can introduce them, you know, to the world and talk about why skunks matter. Um, there's so many different species of skunks, um, but this is the more common one that we actually have down here in South Florida. They're, you don't see them very often because they're very good at, you know, doing their job and hiding um, and only coming out when everyone else is asleep. Um, but we did take these two in. Um, one was from a breeder in Ohio. The other one was from a breeder in Indiana. Um, and they were both taking their time to, you know, get to know us. Um, Chive is doing um, a little, you know, he's definitely stepping up to the plate a lot more quickly because he's definitely food motivated and he loves attention. Um, Rosemary's still a little more reserved, but she's definitely getting there. So we're hoping that we have these guys in a position, you know, sooner than later where we can put harnesses on them, walk them around and introduce them to people who've actually never seen skunks before um, or, you know, are going to think, oh my God, you know, what do they do? Why do they matter? How cool are they? Um, and then we can talk about, again, you know, the different things that they bring to this ecosystem. Um, so they are currently here. They're doing really, really well. And again, over time, I'm hoping that they will be out and about. Um, but for now, we're hoping to get just some fun behind the scenes footage of them to show you guys, you know, via the different social media platforms. Um, and definitely, you know, any training that we're doing with them, we want you guys to be able to see their progress. Um, Kiwi is a barred owl who is also from Georgia. She's actually from the same facility that Lime came from, and she will be joining us in a month. Um, they're currently working on her 
um, flight carrier so that she can also come to us on a plane uh, from Atlanta. And we're hoping that'll happen in the middle of November. Um, so we're excited to bring her on board. She's one of those that unfortunately was injured um, beyond the ability for her to be released. Um, she does have a wing injury that doesn't allow her to fly. Um, so once she does arrive, our goal is going to be to just kind of, again, get to know her, uh, figure out, you know, her likes, her dislikes, and then figure out a way to communicate, keep her comfortable, and then, you know, kind of, again, get her used to showcasing who she is, any fun behaviors that we're able to teach her and showcase her to the world so that they can, again, learn and see these guys super up close and just develop that appreciation for them. Lastly, number 11 is Miss Pumpkin. She's the one that I thought would be yelling by now, but I guess she got her yelling done this morning. Um, she, I picked her up last week from Apopka, the Avian Reconditioning Center. Um, so she's been with us for, you know, only a little bit, but um, she is one of the ones that, again, has an injury that doesn't allow her to be released. Um, half of her wing had to be amputated. Um, she was found as a fledgling that either fell from her nest inappropriately or got into some sort of trouble and she did sustain a fracture to, you know, half of the one wing. So when they admitted her, they had to go ahead and, you know, amputate that. So unfortunately, she is not able to fly, therefore not able to be released. Um, and she's actually the same age that Olive was when she came to us. Um, so again, lots of spice, lots to say, um, but she loves being on the left. She loves when people look at her. She's definitely aware that everyone loves her and you know she's big and mighty she's literally this big um but she thinks she's the size of an eagle um and when she yelled at us she definitely lets it be known that um you know she's she's here so um you know we're hoping that with her being on board we get to teach people about the diversity of birds of prey that we see here in South Florida the diversity of animals that we intake here at the center um, and the different things that these guys bring to the table about you know again making sure that um, everyone is doing their job the ecosystem is balanced and that we're all doing what we can to live you know and coexist um, peacefully. So what can you guys do to support these guys besides going out to events that we say we're going to go out to? Um, you can, we have an adoption program. Um, so you're allowed to adopt them, which, you know, allows you to provide specific care for that individual. Um, and then, you know, you're allowed to visit. You make sure you can visit them, you know, behind the scenes tour. You can visit them at the events. Um, you get fun little things that they do, you know, throughout the year. Um, and that gets mailed to you, fun photos, you know, extra things that you, other people wouldn't be able to really see. Um, on top of that, we have, you know, our wish list. There's lots of stuff out there just for these guys that our patients wouldn't be able to use. So certain bowls, harnesses, um, enrichment toys, little things like that, because again, we're creating this life for them that, you know, allows them to thrive um, in a human care setting. Um, so we want to make sure that they're stimulated, that they're happy, that they're doing natural things, um, but by also being spoiled because, you know, that they're living the life. Um, and, you know, other ways, you know, you can support is again by coming to our events and, you know, showing some love, telling people about them, um, telling people about who we are, what we do. And again, the goal is to just teach people about wildlife, educate everyone about why, you know, they matter, why it's important that we take care of them, how they take care of us. And, you know, just again, spread the word that these guys are here and they are super excited about everything that they do and that we are excited as an institution to provide them a good life and continue to spread the word about, you know, different wildlife things. So um, again, all the stuff that we do, we're thankful for the support. There are different things that are coming our way and I'm very excited about those things um, as they happen. Um, and we will be sharing that again via our brand new website that is supposed to launch um, this coming year. Uh, it's a little more interactive. Um, and then we have, of course, you know, our collection that is growing. And hopefully as they all get comfortable, they will all be able to go out. And the different little avenues that we're taking to spread the word and to encourage people to, again, care about wildlife and, you know, do our best for wildlife conservation. 
Um, if you guys have any questions, I'll go ahead and answer those if I can. And then, oh, I don't know what happened. There we go. So does anyone have any questions? <laughs> 